First of all, uh, an apology to those who have been waiting. Um, there were uh, logistical matters to be sorted out, uh, a document to be scanned into the system. But we're now ready to, to start. Uh, and uh, welcome all of you to the inquiry, three of you witnesses and uh, one of you, uh, Gemma, being a supporter for your, your mum. In a moment or two, I'm going to invite uh, Mary to uh, ask you to take the, the oath. Uh, we have a, in a, a room aside uh, another witness who is anonymous, uh, and let me say that I, I will swear him in. But first, um, you are used to me by now making restriction orders uh, to protect the anonymity of those who are giving evidence. And on this occasion, we have on the, the panel uh, Mrs. B. F. Uh, and in a side room, Mr. B. G., as they will be known to the inquiry. And in each case, I need first, before we start, to make a restriction order. Um, and uh, as before, those of you who haven't been here, uh, please remember, if you are taking a, any uh, photograph or, or anywhere, are anywhere where, for instance, your mobile phone uh, in camera mode might catch someone, please just be very careful uh, because they should not be uh, identified or identifiable. It, it takes quite an effort for many to come to the inquiry and we really have to respect that and, and you have done throughout. But the first restriction order then in respect of Mrs. BF, ladies first, uh, is, uh, is this, uh, that she, the name and address of witness W0855 and any other identifying information such as the witness's image or a description of their appearance cannot be disclosed or published in any form unless express permission has been given by me or by the solicitor to the inquiry acting on my behalf. Witness W0855 must be referred to only as Mrs. B. F. Bravo Foxtrot. This order remains in force for the duration of the inquiry and at all times thereafter, unless otherwise ordered, uh, and I may vary or revoke the order by making a further order during the course of the inquiry. Now, Mr. B. G., uh, Bravo Golf, the name and address of witness W5228 and any other identifying information, such as the witness's image or a description of their appearance, cannot be disclosed or published in any form unless express permission is given by me or, or by the solicitor to the inquiry acting on my behalf. Witness W5228 must be referred to only as Mr. B. G. This order remains in force for the duration of the inquiry and at all times thereafter unless otherwise ordered and I may vary or revoke the order at any time uh, during the inquiry by making a further order. Those two orders then are made. The identities of those individuals are protected. Um, let us begin then by swearing, uh, asking you each to take the, the oath uh, before Ms. Fraser Butlin uh, asks you uh, the questions. Uh, and Mr. BG will be joining us, will he not, uh, for the panel discussion. Indeed, um, I will be asking him questions after I've asked um, Mrs. B. F. questions, so it may be worth having him sworn at the same time as the panel. Well, I, I will swear him in uh, immediately after Mary has sworn in e each of our panel witnesses. Mary. Your full name is known to the inquiry, and here you'll be known as Mrs. B. F. Please take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. 
and nothing but the truth. <clears throat> Please state your full name. Wendy Woods. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly and sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Please state your full name. My name is Robert Eleanor. And repeat after me. I do solemnly and sincerely. I do solemnly and sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Well, let us have uh, Mr. B. G. Then, uh, Mr. B. G. Can you hear me? Yes. Would you take the book in your right hand, please, and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Ms. Fraser Butler. Thank you, sir. Robert, if we can start with you. In 1960, when you were about five years old, you had an accident at home. I did. And you fell hitting the edge of a brick wall at what you've described as full force. Yes. And you sustained some fairly serious injuries. What were they? I received um, a big cut on the top of my head, and uh, then I damaged my nose and my forehead, and uh, I kind of remember that I had a big turban because I had lots of stitches up my head. Of course, the, the stitches have now, uh, the scars now reduced. And it also affected your sinuses. It did. Uh, and so had some impact on your hearing. It did. You had ongoing problems after that with facial pain and hearing difficulties. I did. So in 1970, you underwent facial cranial reconstruction surgery. Yes, I did. And then you had a second surgery in October 1973 to do some further reconstruction work. Yes, I did. And on that occasion, there were considerable complications in there the operation. Was. Yes. What can you tell us about what happened? I, I can tell you um, about what happened afterwards. Obviously, during the operation, I can't really tell you too much. I know that after the operation, it seemed to take a very, very long time. Um, and uh, after I'd kind of woken up, um, I was talking to my mum and saying, what, what happened? She said, well, during that time, you had to have a blood transfusion because you had lost a huge amount of blood. I would like to just go slightly back. During the time from when I hit the brick wall until uh, up until the first operation, I used to routinely get nosebleeds. Um, so a couple of times the ambulance came to the came to the hospital, uh, came to the house and took me away to the local hospital. So nosebleeds were something that were quite common for me. The the second operation, I remember, I had some very large packs put into my nose. The first the first operation, they were relatively small packs. But the second time, they were enormous, and, and I didn't really understand why. And then about four, three or four days later, then to remove them, I had to have another, another general anesthetic to, to remove them. And I ended up staying in the hospital, the hospital for quite a long time. You were in hospital, you think, for about two to three weeks. Yes. Um, and then a few months after the surgery, you became very unwell. I did. And again, what can you tell us about that? Um, well, at that time, in, in 1974, 73, 74, people didn't talk about hepatitis. They talked about jaundice, uh, and I think that's a fairly common theme for most people that have suffered from it. I remember being very yellow, um, and my eyes were very yellow. My skin was really not very nice, but I had terrible stomach pains and, and back pain. 
And I, I lived um, in a kind of post-war uh, council house, so, you, you know, when you were really sick, you, your mum moved your bed from upstairs to downstairs, and uh, I ended up staying in the living room, it was the TV room, basically, with the fire uh, for quite a long time. And then uh, when, when that happened, the doctor, and bear in mind, this doctor, I'd known him for a long time because he kept seeing me for one reason or another and lots of infections. And uh, he came to see me daily. I don't know why, um, but he, he seemed very, very concerned about me. But you did recover after that. I did. And life went back to normal. Yep. Um, between then and when you found out that you had hepatitis C, yep. were you ever contacted by anyone about the transfusion or, or followed up in any way at all? No, and I, and I could kind of understand that because I lived 10 years in the United States and then 30 years in Singapore. So my medical records would have been uh, under the basis that medical records get destroyed. I, 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 th I could understand why they couldn't find me. And then how did you first come to know that you had hepatitis C? Oh, um, in 2015, I was working on a pretty big project to build an underground metro system in, in Singapore. And part of that work was to do testing. And we had to take a team of fire service people to Spain where they had a, a kind of a, a practice tunnel, if you like. And we set up and we did a lot of work inside the tunnel. That was for about nearly six weeks. During that time, I really started to notice that things were not quite right in my body. Um, terrible aches in my legs, back to the stomach pains again. But the thing that was happening to me that was probably more prevalent than anything was that I was losing huge amounts of weight. I'm not a big guy. I'm, I'm tall, but I'm pretty skinny. I'm, I'm 60, 68 kilos. So to lose another 15 kilos was quite ridiculous. So yeah, that was one of the biggest things that happened. Yeah. And you were needing to urinate at night a lot? A lot. And um, it was very I, dark. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, you, you know, we're working in Singapore, in running and managing a team of, team of people. We had a lot of um, people that were Muslim. And uh, they routinely uh, would drink, uh, sorry, not drink, during, during, uh, uh, during the Ramadan period. And so it was almost common to have pictures of what urine is supposed to look like. I know this might sound a bit funny, especially, I don't know if they do it in ladies' toilets, but in men's toilets, we have little signs. And it goes from light to dark. My, mine went very dark, almost black. Uh, you were still unwell in... 2017, yep. and at that point you went to go went to the doctors. Um, wife made me go. I, I have to confess, um, men are not very good at taking care of their bodies. I think women are much better at it. And she got tired of me constantly needing to urinate. I mean, it was not just old man syndrome of two or three times a night. This was about every hour. Um, this was like irritable bladder. You know, it was like, well, what's going on with my body? And she finally said, enough. You have to go to the doctors. This is annoying me. I'm trying to do my job. I'm a teacher, a kindergarten teacher. And she said, I, 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 you just have to do something. So I went to the local kind of equivalent of a GP. Now, please understand, in Singapore, we don't have an NHS. Everything that you do has to be paid for. Um, normally by your company and your employer's insurance system, so you go to that managed business to go and go to see the doctor. So, yeah. And that doctor uh, took blood tests, yeah. uh, uh, did blood tests, and told you that you were positive for hepatitis C? No, not, not exactly. Um, the, the doctor was a very keen, um, uh, uh, I would say sharp doctor. He was a kind of a GP. And he then wrote me a note. He took the blood samples. Then he wrote me a note. He said, please go and see this other specialist gastro guy uh, within our group of, of hospital, your, our group of medical. And uh, he sent me to see a man called Dr. Monga. Um, Dr. Monga then, by that time, had the blood test. And he sat and he explained to me what the results were. I had high uh, numbers that weren't right, A AFT levels that were, A ALT levels that were not right. And he then did the, um, the little prick, prick test, blood test, uh, take a sample, and uh, it was showing positive. 
So being the way that the doctor's offices are there, he then sent me to another next room where they did a, um, uh, an ultrasound test and showed that my, my liver was fatty. Now, at that time, I will confess that, you know, working in business in Asia, that involves quite a lot of alcohol uh, use. So I thought maybe, never mind, it's not that. It's, uh, it must be, must be alcohol use. So I kind of put that to one side. Dr. Monga told you about interferon and ribavirin as a treatment. She did. And um, what was your sort of thoughts about that? Well, for me, um, interferon had something to do with AIDS, I think. Uh, I, I didn't really know what hepatitis C was anyway. Uh, and uh, he explained it to me that I would need to take this medicine. But it seemed like was it really the right medicine for me at that time? I, I didn't feel that unwell. I mean, okay, I had lots of cramps and, and, and pains in my stomach, but I could cover that over. I could take ibuprofen and all the other over-the-counter things that would make it go away. But, yeah, it just had a, a stigma attached to him. And he's, the, the, the biggest thing of all that he mentioned, he said that, oh, yes, I have a friend in, in India uh, that can get you this medicine relatively kind of off-brand, uh, but it will still cost you $100,000, which was about £50,000. Quite frankly, I didn't have that kind of money. Um, and, and certainly as a man, it wasn't money that I was going to spend on my health care. It was more needed for my family at the time. So, yeah, I just, <coughs> just put it to one side, frankly. I buried it. I took his... He wrote me a, a prescription for an RNA test, which I really didn't know what that was at the time, and, uh, and to go and get a genome test, which I also didn't know what he was talking about. So I took the file, I took it home with a smile on my face, and I put it in a filing cabinet, and I buried it. And every now and again, when I felt really ill over the next, next couple of years, I would dig it out and take a look at it, just to remind myself that Possibly I was hep C positive, yeah. And part of the context as well was that you were due to return to the UK about three years after that. Yes, I was. And what were your concerns about, if you were hepatitis C, what impact that would have on your job in Singapore? In, in Singapore, it would have really been very difficult because, as I've explained, the company provides you insurance um, and you, you need to have some kind of insurance. It would have also meant explaining to my wife why my company has taken away my insurance. Because, to be honest with you, I didn't tell anybody. I just, the only people that knew about it was me and Dr. Monga. That was it. So it, it could have meant me losing my job. The other thing that was happening at that time was my platelet count uh, was decreasing quite considerably. And one of the measures that you have to do every year after you pass uh, 62 in Singapore is to take a medical check. So since I was a, a project lead, I needed to go to site. And one of the issues there is that if you have an accident, um, you, you know, if they, these are process platforms and they're, they're up in the air and you fall 40 meters down, you, you, maybe you die, but also the, uh, the issue with blood loss would be a big problem. So they don't like blood uh, platelet counts. So the, the form requires, are you fit to work? And there's a note there that says in, in the, one of the medical reports that says low platelet count, please put a mark by it. So they didn't measure for hepatitis at that time in that because that report goes back to my company and that report then ties it to the insurance whereas the private test that I had done, so I, I separated them. That's how I did it, really. And you just said you, you didn't also tell your family. No. Why was that? Um, shock, I think. Shock and stigma. Um, <coughs> like I said, when he told me I related a hep C to HIV, when, especially when, when, there was, uh, when he talked about the interferon and ribavirin treatment, I didn't know how to explain to them. My children were already left and come to university in the UK anyway, so it was just me and my wife. But, yeah, I just honestly, I really didn't know how to do it. And I, I uh, a little bit later, we talk about how she eventually found out, which was <laughs> really a bit quite shocking. But. You returned to the UK in June 2020. Yes. 
Uh, and uh, sort a sort of GP uh, appointment. You eventually registered with the GP in August 2021 yep. because of COVID. No, August, August, August 20, I was able to actually go to the, I was in the process of, you, you know, when we came back, obviously we came back in the middle of, of COVID one and COVID two, as I call it. And we, we were the first batch of pretty much housed um, uh, quarantine people that came from overseas. So we had to isolate. So the first thing I wanted to do was re kind of resurrect our um, our doctor's registration where, where we live. So I did that, went there, but the system had completely changed. So it took some time. Well, by that time, we're now into lockdown two. So things just got extended uh, further out. So by the time that I actually got a, a blood test to get in what it was in my mind, the official diagnosis, because I knew, but I never didn't know. I only had a prick test. I didn't have an RNA test, so I didn't know my viral load. I certainly didn't know what genome type I was. So by the time that I did that, um, I went to the GP. That was August 2021. And then in August 2021, the doctor that I talked to, and, and I will say that he didn't actually go to see him, uh, said, OK, please come and get a blood test. And he asked me why, and I said, because I believe that I might be infected with hepatitis C. And uh, he said, okay, so you come to see the, the phlebotomist and she will take some samples. Well, unfortunately, by that time, he'd left. So now I have a new, another doctor. And that doctor then looked at my results and he wrote a, um, what do you call it? A kind of letter to referral letter. Oh. That got lost in the system. Uh, then talked to another doctor because that by that time that second doctor had now left and so now it's a third doctor and she um, uh, sorry one step before that can may I because I, I need to thank somebody sitting there the, the results that I had came to me through the patient access NHS website and the results that I had seemed to suggest that my viral load was very high I didn't know what to do so I wrote a very nice letter to the Hepatitis C Trust saying, to whom it may concern, I think I might have Hepatitis C. And I was responded to by a very nice lady sitting there called Samantha May, who then pointed me in the right direction. She said, I can't give you a clinical diagnosis, but it rather seems that you, you, you based on your viral load, that you do actually have Hepatitis C. So. Then I went back to, I mean, talked to Sam, I went back to the doctor, now the third doctor, uh, Dr. Shehata, and talked with her and I said, look, I'm pretty sure that I have hepatitis C. I don't want to become a burden on the system. I said, if, if my viral load is this high, does it make sense to get me treatment now rather than later? Please hurry. I really want to take the medicine and see if I can get cured. So she then wrote a referral letter to the hospital, which was then lost again. I then went back to Mid Sussex Council and talked to their referral service, who immediately wrote a message then saying, OK, please, Mr. East Surrey Hospital, please do something for this guy. And they then wrote uh, and told me, sent me an appointment. So by now, that's now December 2021. So that's kind of the sequence of events there. And then you went to your appointment at the hospital? Yes. And what were you told then? Um, erase everything that you have already know and start again. So um, it was kind of funny because a friend of mine said to me that. He said, you know, they will probably start again, and they did. And, uh, every, and then the series of tests then, I have to say, was amazing because it, it seemed like every day I was going to the hospital. I had a pile of orders for bloods like <laughs> this high. They were just one after the other. Um, and uh, then started things like uh, ultrasound and CT scan and another ultrasound. And that took me through Christmas 2021. And by that time, um, I got a phone call one evening, a slightly embarrassing phone call for, for me anyway. Um, the doctor, the young uh, registrar underneath the, the doctor called me on my mobile phone in my car. 
and my wife was sitting there, and I was sitting here, and he said, oh, Robert, I can confirm you have hepatitis C, like it was some like Christmas gift. And this was on speakerphone, because yep. you were in the car. Yep. Um, and considering, I, I must have an, inc I, I know, sorry, no, I must have, I have an incredible wife who uh, was very, very understanding. <coughs> and we went back home, and she thought, I kept reading all this, these papers, and she thought I was just being, um, what do you call that, when somebody is so involved in their medical uh, life, uh, being a bit paranoid about what was wrong with me. And I said, now you understand why, why I was looking. But <coughs> the good news is uh, I'm getting tested. And then the hospital then referred to me to a fantastic lady uh, called Karen Street, uh, who was my hep C lady. She was a hepatitis specialist nurse. Yes, yeah, specialist nurse, yes. And from there you had more tests and a fibro scan, okay. but you also got started on a 12-week course of Zapatio. Yes. And you um, speak very positively about the hepatitis nurse specialist. I do. Um, what particularly was so good in her treatment of you? I think when, when I walked through the door, um, she, she has a very strong Irish accent, which is very cute. Mm -hmm. and, and she told me about how we, this was going to be a journey for us. And she said, this is the first day of our journey. Um, you, you have to be, she, at the time she explained it in a way, and, I, and I, I, my recollection of it was that it seemed like I had to be put forward as, as, uh, to a, as a recommendation to take the medicine, um, because she explained that the medicine was very expensive. And the, the way that it was kind of put to me was that uh, there was a panel decision now, the problem that I was having, because of COVID-2 and the, the high peak of COVID-2, there were no spaces to measure what genotype I was. So it was sent originally to Sussex Hospital in Brighton, then eventually it was then changed and sent to another, another testing agency, independent testing agency, I think. Um, and it came back as genotype 1A. And uh, at that point, then they could then prescribe the actual medicine for me. But so again, just one delay after another, primarily caused by the pandemic, to be honest with you. But she, she sat me down, did the fibro scan for me, explained what was gonna happen to me in the next few weeks uh, and months and years. Um, and she's just been amazing. She's so helpful to me, um, explains everything. We sit through, we look at the results each time. The, day uh, that she called me about my um, SVR level it was fantastic. She was, I think, I honestly believe she was happier than I was. I, I think she was amazing. When she, when she called, the, tele the telephone rang. And it was, quite, it was quite interesting because it was the same day that the investigator, investigator, the, um, Mr. The inquiry Jim, member. Yeah, the inquiry member uh, had interviewed me. So I literally finished interviewing with him, came out, there was a message on my telephone, please call Karen. And, and it was the same day. And um, you had uh, cleared the virus? No, at that point my, my viral load had dropped from 20 million to 43. And I remember asking her, you mean 4,300, 43,000? No, she said 43. So in, half the time the viral load had gone to almost nothing. Having finished the treatment, your viral load is... Now zero. Okay. Uh, SVL level, SVL 12 was zero. Um, Not in, zero, unmeasurable, I should say, sorry. <laughs> um, you, you obviously uh, had a lot of support from the hepatitis nurse specialist. Were you also offered any more formal psychological support at any point? I was. Um, I don't, I'm a pretty positive person. I think we've, we've met a couple of times, so I think you, know, you can see that I'm a fairly positive person. Although there are times when the, uh, I don't know if it's the appropriate time to talk about it, but the kind of ongoing things, the things that I'm now left with, it's okay, the virus is gone. But what about all the things that had accumulated over time and that I'm left with? So, for example, I, I can't close my hand and, and there's other, 
I was described by the, the uh, rheumatologist at the hospital the other day as ha was 67 years old, but, but having the body of a 78-year-old internally. So I'm very worried about the future, to be honest with you. And do you want to tell us any more about what the ongoing physical uh, uh, impact yeah. has been? Um, I started with, you know, terrible cramps and joint pains, and that's when I first started to notice that the virus was sort of really starting to come out in my system, because prior to that, I was a climber, I'm a runner, I'm a diver, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. Um, but I've noticed that in, since 2000, really since 2015, that things have started to fall apart a bit, and it could be just the age, I guess, I suppose. and, and the problem for me with hepatitis C is, is, is it's too easy to write things off. Um, grumpy. Well, if you're only sleeping about three hours a night, of course you're grumpy. Everybody is. I, I, I think most people would be anyway. Um, so I'm, I, it's during, it's something funny is that during the time of actually taking the medicine, I felt much better. But since that time, some of the effects have all started to come back again. The, I have, the guy was feeling my fingers the other day. He said, you have nodules. I have nodules in my toes. Um, I have problems with my L3 and L4 um, spine. So I've been taken care of by the Queen Victoria Hospital in, in, in East Grinstead for really for physiotherapy for my hands, my back, my, you know, I mean, almost everything, frankly. Uh, and, but they're being very, again, they're being very good to me. And you applied to the EIBSS for financial assistance. I did. Uh, and you sent with your application a bundle of documents. I did. And you were then asked for further documents. Uh, so you phoned the EIBSS to query that. I did. What happened in that conversation? Um, when, I, uh, when I first made my application, please understand that the EIBS or the inquiry is not exactly well known in Singapore. Uh, never heard of it. Uh, really had never heard of it until the very first time when I contacted with uh, the Hep C Trust. Um, and they told me about the inquiry and told me about the, the EIBSS. So I gathered together as many of my, my own personal documents that I could, and I scanned all those, and I sent them with my application. So I sent them, first of all, by email, um, but what I did is, I come from a contracting world, so copied myself and then sent them a screenshot of all the zip files that I had sent to them. And the EIBSS called me and said, oh, um, we, haven't, we need additional information from you. So I asked them, what would you like? I, I'd had a shoulder, a shoulder operation in Singapore. Do you need information from the uh, National University Hospital in Singapore, because if it does, I'm gonna have to pay for that. It's gonna be a bit of a, uh, of, of a, a trek to be able to do it. They said, no, no, no. Um, uh, then they told me, they said, they didn't need any documents. I said, but hang on, you just called me to tell me that you needed documents, and now you're saying, well, you don't need them. I said, have you actually looked at what I've sent? And I really feel even now that they didn't really look at the PDF files that I sent. I really don't believe they did. Your application was refused, and I just yes. want to look at the refusal letter at yes. WITN 7082005. If we just pick it up in the middle. Unfortunately, your application has been declined. Applications can only be authorised where there is evidence that on the balance of probabilities an applicant's been chronically infected with hepatitis C through treatment with NHS blood or blood products in England prior to September 1991. You have provided evidence that your hepatitis C infection has become chronic. There is no evidence of a transfusion being administered during your rhinoplasty operation. Our assessors believe the need for a transfusion for this type of operation is very low. Our assessors also noted occupational exposure during the 30 years you spent in the Singapore police force could also be a risk factor. Police officers face elevated risk of acquiring bloodborne diseases such as hepatitis C from accidental needle stick injuries. Your dual exposure to hepatitis C and hepatitis B supports this. Now you accepted in retrospect the description you used on your application form of having had a rhinoplasty yes. rather than 
craniofacial yeah. reconstruction didn't sufficiently capture how serious the surgery had been. No, it did. But have you ever been a member of the Singapore Police Force? No. Could we I can't turn... be, because I was never a Singapore citizen. Could we turn to WITN 7082006, please? Within your bundle of documents that you had submitted, it, it included a, a letter, this letter, and a form that followed. And it uh, says in terms, as you've been certified medically fit to drive, you may continue to drive until your next medical examination. We will notify you of the need to attend your next medical examination when you're approaching your next age limit under the law. If you are a foreigner, <coughs> you may continue to drive until your driving license expires or until your next uh, medical examination, whichever is earlier. Should you at any time be diagnosed to be unfit to drive by a medical practitioner, you're required to return your driving license to the traffic police. And then the document continues with the medical report. And you've explained in your statement that this is a standard letter in Singapore confirming that you were permitted, you were fit to drive in Singapore. Yes. When you reach the age of 62, you have to have a medical examination, eye test, um, heart check, this, this kind of thing. After your refusal uh, of your application, you then sought your medical records, yes. but they had been destroyed. Yes. You then tried to obtain more information from the EIBSS about why your application had been rejected. I did. And you were told your application form would be returned to you. Yes. Uh, and you replied, and I just want to look at that correspondence. WITN 7082010. Starting on page four, please, Lawrence. And it's the email at the bottom. Dear Jess, thanks for the information today. Appreciate that you're sending back my original application. Was hoping that I might get back the original assessment so I can understand why my application was denied. In particular, I want to understand why the assessor thought I had worked for the Singapore Police Force from the in original information I submitted with my application. Can I have these documents, please? Or is this included with the application documents you're sending back to me? And if we go to page three... the bottom, you got effectively a standard response saying, we've arranged for your application and postal evidence to be returned to you as requested. An appeal may be considered if you feel our decision on the medical application was not justified on the evidence you provided. You then responded uh, at the top of this page, please. I think there's been a misunderstanding. I didn't ask for my application to be returned. What I asked for was an explanation from the review of my application as to why my most probably cause of, probable cause of infection was due to my employment as a Singapore, Singapore policeman. Can you please help me with this question? As explained in earlier correspondence, that I've never been a policeman, and the only way I could have been infected is through a blood transfusion given to me by the NHS in 1973. Uh, as to additional evidence, as you are aware, my medical records have been destroyed. This has been confirmed by North Bristol Trust by email, which was forwarded to EIBSS. Would like to have the explanation as to why EIBSS think that I was infected as a policeman uh, to include with my further evidence for my appeal. And then if we go back to page two... <coughs> There is an apology for the confusion that's been caused, and then they said this. Your concerns surrounding the medical assessor's opinion on your hepatitis C stage one application and the evidence received have been noted. EIBSS have reviewed the application and agrees that there is no mention of you working within the police force in Singapore, which would carry a risk of infection with hepatitis C on the balance of probabilities. This assessor's opinion will be disregarded and we will be submitting your application for a separate opinion. That was the 30th of September. Thank you, Lawrence. And then three days ago, you were told that your application to the EIBSS had been accepted and was successful. Yes. Thank you.
Look, did they by any chance know that he was due to give evidence here? Sir, I wouldn't know. Have you any reason to think they did? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yes. Do you have any reason to think that they knew that you were going to give evidence here? I don't believe so. I, know, I, I certainly never no, told that, that, them. That, that's all that I, I wanted yeah, to be clear about. So. <coughs> Thank you. Wendy, Hello. you gave birth to your third daughter, Gemma, who's sitting next to you, in 1981. Mm -hmm. And you required an emergency <coughs> caesarean section. I did. And you woke up and saw that you were receiving blood. I did. From that time on, mm -hmm. did you ever receive any other blood transfusion? No. From 1981 until you were diagnosed with hepatitis C, mm -hmm. did anyone contact you at all about that transfusion or follow you up in any way? No. no. And had you moved house yes. many times in that window? Yes. How yes, many I times did. had you moved? Oh. A lot. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how you then came to find out that you were infected with hepatitis C? I went to have a blood test, obviously, and they sent me to this doctor at West Suffolk Hospital. Um, and he examined me and he said he thought I had fatty liver. And uh, then the next thing I knew, I had an appointment to have a scan. Uh, do they ever call it? You know, like you have when you have a baby. That the ultrasound scan. Ultrasound, that's right. Um, and I went for that, and I didn't get anything until I received a letter to say that I had hepatitis C. So just tracking back, in terms of that very first blood test that triggered the referrals, mm -hmm. why did you have that first blood test I, at the GP? I still can't remember why, what I had it for, because, I mean, I hadn't had any... I'm not the type of person who's had anything else, you know. I, haven't, I don't go to the doctors unless I have to. So I don't know why. They, he said that that was fatty and then turned out to be hepatitis C. As far as you and the family can recall, you think it was just a routine blood I test think so. yeah, that, that flagged that been. your liver function was abnormal? Mm -hmm, must have been. And initially, what were you told about the probable cause of the fatty uh, liver what was before that? it was hepatitis C? They, they um, rejected it and said that I... would right. So if, when you first saw the doctor and they said you had a fatty liver, uh -huh. I think they said they thought it might be something to do with your diabetes. Yes. Is that right? Yes, yes. And then you were tested, and as you say, the first thing you knew about having hepatitis mm. C was a letter through the post. Mm -hmm. Can we look at that letter? Um, <coughs> WITN 38120003. I saw you in the GI clinic because you have some abnormal blood tests regarding the liver. I'd explained that... Oh, sorry. I had explained to you that the most probable explanation of that is an underlying fatty liver disease due to your diabetes and being overweight. Unfortunately, the new bloods have revealed that you have another factor that contributes to the blood's abnormality and affect the liver. It's called cro chronic hepatitis C and is actually a viral infection of the liver which needs some specific treatment. Um, Thank you. And it indicates that it's generally quite a, a, an effective treatment. But what, was, <coughs> what were your feelings when you received that letter telling you that you had hepatitis C? A shock. I didn't, didn't realise. And that when <coughs> I went into it, I realised that all the things I'd had, the complaints and that I'd had earlier, were to do with the um, having hepatitis C. <coughs> Immediately after that letter, what discussions did you have with doctors about having hepatitis C? The only one I went to see at Ipswich Hospital, and she was very, very good, and she told me that I definitely got hepatitis C and that I should report it because, <coughs> you know, it was an infection that they gave me sort of thing in the blood transfusion. And I think you say in your statement that was a, a hepatitis nurse specialist. Yes, she was, yes. She, had, she was very good because I had to travel to Ipswich from 
the first time I did go to see her, but I've, at the time I was looking after my husband, who was on um, at, yeah, oxygen 24-7, so I was his carer, <coughs> um, and I had to get somebody to sit in with him because I couldn't leave him. Um, and from then on, I had, had a blood test in the Ipswich Hospital, and then from then on she sent me all the things that I needed through the post, and she also put me on a tablet that they delivered to the door. <coughs> And that was the Epclusa treatment? Yes. yes. Yes, I had that for three months. And she did everything for you? She did. By phone and yep. post at she that She used point. to keep in touch with me on the phone every week to see I was all right and everything. She was very, very good. And did she provide you with um, a, an opportunity to talk about the infection and the effect it had on you as well? Yes, I did speak to her about it, yes. Um, just... Thinking a little bit more about that, did anyone talk to you about whether you'd had, um, sorry, did, did, did anybody offer you any formal psychological support no. at that point? No. And in, in hindsight, do you think that might have been something you would have wanted to take up? Um, I, I don't know, because I, as I say, I was looking after my husband, so I had, <clears throat> had that job to do, so I really didn't sort of dwell on this you know, the heaven, the hepatitis C. You've talked in your statement, though, that the infection did frighten you. It did. Uh, why, what particularly frightened you? <laughs> well, I think when you get something like that, you just think, you feel sort of dirty, you know, and, and think, people will think. And so I didn't tell anybody. I only told the children, you know, my children and that. I mean, I didn't sort of discuss it with my husband or anything like that. And you also say in your statement you were worried about the possibility that you might have infected other yes, people. Yes, I was, yes. I had to be careful that I didn't cut myself from bleed. So when I was with my daughter and my grandchildren, um, my husband had to have some blood tests <clears throat> to, just to make sure. And you was always careful when you were preparing anything that you didn't cut yourself or touch them and infect them. And I think you had a fear that because it had taken so long for you to be mm -hmm. diagnosed, you might have unknowingly infected someone exactly. in that time frame. Exactly. Was there anything particular about that time frame that you were especially worried about? Well, I worked with children, um, and I didn't know I had it, obviously. So, I mean, I could have infected anybody, couldn't I, in that time? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what your physical health had been like? Between having the transfusion <coughs> and being diagnosed with hepatitis C? Mm -hmm. I had, <coughs> um, when I could be walking along the street and all of a sudden I had this sort of like, a, like I was going to pass out and I just had to stop, sit down wherever I was and I was white and, you know, I mean, shaking and things like that. I had that. I had brain fog. Um, which was really bad, and I went to the doctors, and they even sent me for a scan because I thought I had a brain tumour. I was sure I had a brain tumour, you know, because I couldn't remember anything. And just the symptoms that I had then, I'm now would be able to tie them in with the hepatitis C. You also had quite significant fatigue. I did, definitely. Can, can you tell us what that was tired. like? Yes, that was. You just didn't seem to have any energy at all. You know, you just wanted to sit down and sleep. And you also had skin itching and a feeling of things crawling. Yes, I did. Very bad. And I thought that was probably what to do with something I'd eaten. <laughs> and I, you just, I mean, I just couldn't even sit down on a chair. That was just horrible. It just felt like there was a load of ants crawling on me. You also had thyroid problems. Yes. <coughs> and you have diabetes. Well, it's um, diet-related. I don't take any pills or anything like that. <laughs> During the investigations for those health concerns mm -hmm. that, over the years, mm -hmm. did anyone talk to you about whether you'd had a blood transfusion in the past no, when they were investigating any of that? No, not that I knew of, that I can remember, no. And since having the treatment, mm -hmm. what's your position, your situation now? Um, at the moment, I, they say I'm all right. I haven't had any blood tests until, which seems funny, I had Wednesday before I came up here, I had a letter from my doctor to say I've got to go for a hepatitis blood test at the hospital. And this, I was supposed to have this a year ago. And I didn't get the letter till Wednesday. 
what can you tell us about what's been happening with your follow-up? What's, what's been the difficulty? Well, I haven't had any follow-up. I haven't had any help, really. I've just carried on. I'm just hoping that, that I'm all right and everything else. Because once you'd finished the treatment, uh -huh. everything just seemed to then uh -huh, stop. stop. Mm -hmm. And you've been working to try and get hold of people to have a proper follow-up. Exactly. Exactly. Which the, <coughs> the hospital um, said they didn't want to see me anymore. They put it through to the doctor. And like I say, I haven't had any blood test or anything um, until I got this letter on Wednesday to go to have a blood test. You um, applied for financial assistance from the EIBSS mm -hmm. uh, and your first application was refused. Mm -hmm. And if we can look at the refusal letter, um, WITN 3812006, please. We see the standard uh, paragraphs and then this. The supporting medical information submitted in your application did not provide sufficient evidence um, that this is the case, that, that you had been in infected um, through treatment prior to September 1991. Our medical assessor also states that in addition to there being insufficient evidence, um, hepatitis C genotype 2A is rare in the UK and so it makes it more unlikely that the infection was acquired from a blood transfusion if given. Thank you. So in terms of your medical records, first of all, mm -hmm. um, you, with assistance from Gemma, <laughs> tried to get hold of your records. We did. And in terms of your own medical records, you found there was a gap. Yes, there was. And the gap ran from the end of March 1981 mm -hmm. to the day after Gemma's birth. Mm -hmm. But everything else was there. Yes. So there was just this gap in the records. There was. There was then at the day after her birth, obviously, reference to you having given birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you also contacted then West, Truffet, West Suffolk Trust about whether they had blood records. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do you recall why you asked about blood records in addition to your own medical records? Mm -hmm. um, can, I speak? Can, you, can you speak? Can you speak? Well, ha have, have, a, have a quick word and then answer the question. Um, it was just to see if I had any transfusion records. Oh, that was just to see if they had any transfusion records. I, I think Gemma, Gemma did a lot of this for she you. She did do it all you. for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a letter from West Suffolk, which it, it would be useful <coughs> to put up. I, w I, I think it might be an idea if we swear Gemma in so that she can help her mum. So I'm very willing to do for that. If, that if would make Gemma's a lot of sense. That, that's, fine, that's fine by me if, if it will help, yeah. Solemnly, sincerely, I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm, do truly, uh, and truly, and truly declare, declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. I'll address my question to both of you, <laughs> and whoever can help <coughs> most is welcome to answer. Um, do you have any recollection of why you sought the transfusion records rather than me the medical records? Why that came to mind? Just, I think, just purely because um, I know Mum had recollection of having a blood transfusion, and my sister had recollection of going to see her in the hospital and had seeing the bags of blood there and having to leave quick because it made her feel ill. Um, so, because we were hitting such a brick wall with medical documents from the GP. Um, it was just a case of where else can I go to find something. Um, so I did contact them to see if they had any records and ultimately they didn't. If we just pull, put the letter up, WITN 3812002, please. <coughs> And it, it says this, the Blood Safety and Quality Regulations 2005 under Regulations 8 and 9 advised 
that blood establishments and hospital blood banks must retain data needed for full traceability of blood component transfusion for at least 30 years from the point of receipt of the blood component. Therefore, the West Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust has kept all records since 2005 and will continue to do so for up to 30 years. In addition, we advise that the Trust's electronic records for blood components began in 1988. Uh, we've carefully checked our electronic records and confirmed that you've not received a blood component in the period you've stated. But of course, 1988 post dates yeah. that the birth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You decided then to apply again uh, for financial assistance and you put some material together to challenge the issue of the genotype 2A. Yeah. What did you do in relation to that? Um, well, I mean, initially, it was a case of what does that mean? What is, you know, a genotype and things? And that's when we again contacted the Hepatitis C Trust for some more help. And they were, you know, fantastic in helping us with that. Um, I looked it up. I think I used uh, Google was my best friend, pretty much. And I just looked it up to see what this genotype thing was uh, going on about. And um, I finally realised that, Yes, the one that mum had was a, a rarer one, but it certainly wasn't um, you know, limited to any other country. The UK has people with genotype 2 in there. Um, and I also watched um, some of the inquiry. I think you had somebody on here who was talking of genotypes and things, and, and even they said, you know, um, it's not impossible to get it. Um, so it was a case of trawling the internet finding any links or information I could get to sort of disprove their theory that there's no way that could have happened in the UK um, and went from there really. And you submitted <coughs> what you've described as a very substantial pack of documents yeah. to EIBSS yeah. explaining why a genotype 2A did not mean mm. it was not necessarily from a UK blood transfusion. Exactly yeah and, and that as well as other evidence of past medical things that could have been um, attributed to having hep C um, and uh, you know just things like that I think we did find one tiny bit of evidence of where someone had written um, uh, you know a large blood loss during surgery or something I think that was the only thing that kind of equated to the fact that mum lost a lot of blood and therefore could you know potentially had a transfusion um, but yeah the stack of documents was Certainly, it was trawling through all the records and highlighting bits and bobs and, yeah. And what you tried to do was to build a, a, an evidence base of the other health difficulties your mum yeah. had had over the yeah. years yeah. that, looking back, you could attribute mm. to the hepatitis mm. C. Yeah, yes, very much so. And there was a lot of them, more than I think we even realised. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely it was time-consuming, but obviously it was beneficial because for them to send that letter and just say you know you know it's it's kind of suggesting that mum got the infection from another means which we know was not true so and the application was then accepted it was yeah yeah <clears throat> Wendy from your perspective when that first application was rejected what what were your feelings about that well, I was angry, to be honest with you. I was, I was really angry because I thought, well, what are they saying? I've been somewhere and I've had a blood transfusion. I know if I've had one, you know, sort of thing. So, <clears throat> so that was why we turned around and fought it again, you know, to, to get it through. But um, the doctors, we had trouble with the doctors to get all the information. You know, they didn't want to, because obviously you'd take a long while because the file was about like that, you know. To get through, but we in the end we just kept on and on and on. And in the end, we felt fought it. Thank you. Mrs. BF, you had a daughter in 1974 and required a cesarean section. That's right, yes. And you then had a son in 1976. Yes. And the plan for that delivery was. For you to have a vaginal delivery? I had hoped so, and I had been given hope up to three weeks 
Well, when I first saw the consultant, actually, three weeks before I was due to deliver. But on the day, the doctor said you had to have a caesarean. Yes, when I was admitted, he said, um, who left you? And um, he, I, I had just previously told the nurse I was over the moon because I could have a, a trial at, at having a normal delivery. And then he said, oh, who left you? And I think she saw my face drop a bit. And um, he realized what he said. But he strongly recommended that um, I had a cesarean section, even though I really didn't want one. And you were offered an epidural. Um, yes, I was, yeah. There were then a series of errors, which yes. meant you had a general anaesthetic for the caesarean section. Um, the, well, the general anaesthetic was my choice in the end because um, he left a junior doctor to call the anaesthetist to come and see me and explain about the two because I'd had um, um, an epidural with my daughter and I had been quite unwell with it. Um, but I had been in labor for quite a long time by that time. So, um, it, But because the anaesthetist never got the message and he never saw me, he said when I was on the operating table, well, you can talk to me now. And I said, well, I, I really can't make the decision now. I just better have um, a general anaesthetic. And your memory is of waking up mm -hmm. and, um, and then what? Um, I just saw a bag of blood there, and I, I was quite surprised. Um. Your understanding is that the blood was ordered in advance of the cesarean section. Possibly, I don't. I don't honestly know that, but um, it possibly was because, you know, the forms seem to suggest that yes, that they had the blood standing by. And you have some concerns about that having, having the transfusion and whether you really required it. C can you tell us about that? Well, they, uh, on my notes, they said I'd lost one unit of, of 500 mil <laughs> of, of blood, um, but I was given um, two transfusions. So that was double what I had lost. But when I had my daughter, I, I didn't have any blood whatsoever and I lost more according to the notes. So you, your concern, I think, correct me, please, if I, I've got this wrong, is that with your daughter, you'd lost more blood and received no transfusion. No. With your son, you had lost some blood, but you'd been given twice the amount that you had lost. Yes, I, that, that's the way I read the notes, yes. And a few weeks after the birth of your son, you became unwell. Yes. What happened? Um, I ran a temperature. Um, it, it sort of felt flu-like. Um, I can just remember actually struggling to bre breastfeed the baby, you know, when I was in bed. It, it, I can't remember precisely now how long it lasted, but um, possibly a day or two. Um, and then I recovered. Um, I didn't see the doctor about it. I didn't know what it was. I just presumed it might be some virus. <laughs> and you said in your statement that from then, you were constantly exhausted. Yes, I was, I was very, very tired. <laughs> Can you tell us about the impact of that on you? Um, when the children were small, I, I, just, I just felt exhausted almost all the time. But then um, we were quite strapped for cash. I mean, it was a time when um, interest rates were going up through the roof and the oil crisis and that sort of thing. So I did get work as well um, in a bar, in a, in a pub, in the evenings. Um, but later on, I got part-time teaching work. I don't think that's in my statement, actually. Um, and I, I really never felt that I could go full-time. I just didn't have the confidence that I would be able to teach as I taught before I had the children. And in the early 90s, you went to see the GP? Yes. On I, a number of occasions, I think. Yeah, <laughs> about different things, yes. But on one particular occasion, you went because you were finding things so tiring and so yes, challenging. Yeah, yeah. And you were offered antidepressants. You were given antidepressants. Yes, yes, yes. What did the GP say about that? What, what was the discussion around that with you? Um, well, she just said, I can't keep papering over the cracks. 
and you should have counselling um, and sort of offered antidepressants. Um, and the antidepressants sort of helped in that I just felt more relaxed, I think, about things. But um, it, it didn't go any further than that with that particular GP because that was really just on the cusp of the time when hepatitis C was, was starting to be discovered as a virus in its own right, you know, the, a damaging virus in its own right. And you continued to have bouts of depression throughout your life? Yes. And you then developed numbness in your toes? Yes, yeah. What can you tell us about, about that and how that developed? Well, when I saw um, the GP about that, I, I sort of think we've sort of skipped a bit, really. Please, please fill can in I, the gaps. Can I go back? Because um, in, be in between, um, the, the first doctor we referred to, she retired, um, and I moved on to another doctor. Um, uh, Anita Roddick announced on the television, I think this is further on in my statement, isn't it, actually, that um, she had received um, a blood transfusion back in the early 70s, and I thought, oh, <laughs> and that she had hepatitis C, and, and it was a sort of warning. And I asked um, a GP about it, and um, he just said, who's Anita Roddick? And um, he didn't even answer the question. Um, and then it was further on, about 2009, I think, when I started to query about the numbness in my feet. So I, I think uh, in your statement, you, you say you had the toe number, numbness in the late 90s. And, yes, And it, it slowly progressed. Mm -hmm. But nobody, it wasn't dealt with in any particular way. Well, originally, I sort of thought that um, it was shoes, you know, that they, they just weren't fitting properly. I don't think I asked till I really got numbness in my ankles. And, and then the 2006, 2007 is when you think Anita Roddick was speaking out about um, the hepatitis Around that C. time, it might have been slightly earlier. I'm not absolutely sure of the dates. And when you had that appointment with the GP and you asked about Anita Roddick, uh, you've described the GP being quite dismissive. Yes, he was. How did that make you feel? Well, <laughs> I, I thought it was an irrelevant question, really. Um, but I, 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 I didn't know any differently. You know, I didn't, I didn't know, um, I didn't know much about hepatitis C at the time, and I just accepted what he said. You um, had uh, the, the, the numbness in the toes had spread um, up through to your ankles. Yes. And you were then diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy. Yes. And did anyone at that point discuss any possible cause of the peripheral neuropathy? No. Um, I, I, I was sent to see um, a consultant about it, and she did all the tests. She did do blood tests, but they didn't show up anything that um, showed that there was any inflammation. That, that was according to the letter that she sent the GP. Do you know whether hepatitis C was specifically tested for at that point? No, I had no idea. <laughs> you had a hip replacement in 2008. Yes. Uh, and again in 2000, the other hip in 2012. That's right, yes. Uh, and you saw a neurologist uh, in... Um, Sorry, before we, before we go there, the, the 2012 hip replacement, you had some problems with, your, with bruising. I have, I've always had problems with bruising. It just doesn't, it didn't clear up. Um, and now I have var varicose eczema. But the surgeon after your second hip replacement referred you to a haematologist. Before I had the operation, the night before, I was suddenly telephoned by the hospital to say, please, would I go in because um, I, uh, I was, something was low in my blood and I needed vitamin K. In, um, it was a drip that they put in. Um, when I went the next morning, they didn't have the... I think they took a blood test to check 
and it was um, I was due to have the operation, so the first thing on the list. But they couldn't do that because um, it came back that the nurse had sent, done the wrong tests. So they quickly did them again, and um, there was no difference. Um, I was still low in whatever it was that they were checking for. I think it was the APTT, is it? APPT and prothrombin. Yes, that's right. Were prolonged, I think. Yes, that's right. And because of that, I think you were then after the op referred to a haematologist to explore uh, whether I there were any issues. Yes, I wasn't referred specifically. Um, the consultant who did the hip operation said that he had sent the blood samples off to the um, consultant and the blood consultant and um, would the GP please follow it up. But thereafter n nothing happened? No, I asked the GP when I saw him for a checkup, and he looked and he said, oh, it's not necessary. Uh, and then in 2018 you saw the neurologist again because the neuropathy had spread up to your knees? Yes, yes. A and what were you told at that point? They didn't know what was causing it, basically. Um, my, the, the main question in my head was, um, could I still drive? And he checked the strength of my responses and said, yes, I could still drive. Because at that time, the um, DVLA had withheld my, my license. Tracking back a little bit, 2017, yeah. you saw a new GP. And you yeah. raised concerns about hepatitis. Yes, I raised it again with a different GP. Why did you raise it again in 2017? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it, um, I, I really can't remember, to be honest. Do you recall what response you got when you raised it? He said, oh, it's very unlikely. You've described it as being largely dismissed again in 2017. Yes, definitely. Yes, yeah. And then later on in 2017, you had a routine test for irritable bowel and uh, had a colonoscopy. Yes. And at that point, you were told your liver markers were raised. No. Um, well, you had a, a raised mark on your liver. I had that. I saw a, a, another GP. I think it was about irritable bowel, and she took a blood test, so just a standard blood test. And um, when that came back, it, it showed that I had some inflammation of the liver. And she just said, we'll do a, another blood test in six months' time um, and see, because she said it could just be as a result of viral infection. But she wasn't thinking about um, a really serious virus like hepatitis C, I don't think. You had the further test about 12 months later. Why was there that? Sorry, can you repeat that? You had the um, further test of the, the liver markers in, in about 12 yes. months afterwards. I, I think that was another routine test that she did. She was a GP, it was a different GP yes. again, and she liked to do routine tests on her older patients. Um, and I, d I asked her, um, brought, brought it up, because I had seen um, a, you know, a, a trainee in between and she looked and she said, oh, it's still up. Um, and then I said, you know, that I had had this blood transfusion and that I had heard that it could be connected with hepatitis C. Um, and she said, oh, she said, I don't like unanswered questions. She said, we'll do a specific blood test. She said, it's easy to find out. And, and, and you had the test? Yeah. And what happened then? She phoned me up about three or four weeks later and said, um, I'm ever so sorry to tell you you've got hepatitis C. And that was early December 2018? Yeah, I think so, yes. yes. Over 42 years after yes. your transfusion? Yes. You received a phone call about your diagnosis. Yes. What were your feelings about being told over the phone? I thought it was a bit harsh, but on the other hand, if I had been sent a letter and asked to go in, I would probably have been worried. So, you know, it's, I suppose six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, what was the impact for you on your mental well-being of the diagnosis? I was scared. 
Um, I was really worried, yes. Can you help us any more about what you were particularly worried about? I was worried um, about infecting, having infected other people, and particularly the family. I was worried about um, the, the prognosis for the rest of my life, really, and what sort of end I would have. You've described in your statement that you felt like a biohazard at I home. I did, I did at point. Yes, I, I can remember even going for a walk at one point and cutting myself on a bramble, and then going back and actually cutting the bramble and putting it in the hedge so nobody else would, would maybe trip over it and you'd be infected. What did the GP advise you uh, once you had the first diagnosis? She's, uh, she was supportive in that she said, if you, if you want to talk to me, you know, you can phone me at any time. But she said, I can't answer your questions because I don't know very much about this disease. Um, she, she referred me urgently to, to a specialist. And um, she also advised me to contact the Hepatitis Trust if I had any questions. And what happened with that urgent referral? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, I, I had a letter from the hospital to say if I hadn't heard in 10 days, I was to phone them, and I hadn't heard. So I phoned them, and I was given an appointment. And um, it was very close to Christmas in 2018. And when I looked um, at the heading, I sort of thought, I'm not quite sure this is right. But anyway, I went for the appointment, um, and it was a registrar. And she said, I'm ever so sorry, but you've been directed to the wrong um, department for, I can't remember now. Um, for hep hepatology, I think. Or yes, hepto yes, hepatology. And um, she said, I will refer you. I mean, she did examine me, and she did find that the, the liver was um, showing signs of inflammation. And she said, I will refer you to the um, hepatitis specialist and I'll have all the tests done so that when you do see her, um, everything can go ahead smoothly. And then I asked her about treatment and she said, oh, I don't think you'll be eligible for that. Um, and I said, well, I thought I had a right to it. And, and if I had a right to it, I wanted it. She didn't say anything to that. <laughs> Did she explain why she didn't think you would be eligible? No. I, I think the inference was that I just simply wasn't ill enough. And um, I did wonder whether it was my age. What impact did that conversation with the registrar have on you? I was upset. Um, because I was frightened because I thought I'd been given this disease by the National Health Service and that um, they shouldn't withhold treatment. I felt there was a moral right to treatment, um, that I shouldn't have to wait until I was seriously ill. I couldn't see the logic in it, actually, because that would be far more expensive to them. <laughs> You were then told, I think, that your appointment wouldn't be until the end of March 2019. Yes. And during that wait, you started to research things more online. Mm -hmm. And what effect did that have on you? Well, I was scared, again, by, by what I had read. I, I found it quite, quite informative on the um, effects that hepatitis C could have on you. Um, and I also researched um, other sources of finding the cure um, because I, I, I realized that you could actually buy the, the medication, but you, you then did have to have a specialist to help you or to, to, to monitor you when you took it. You were told that the March appointment would be with a registrar. Why yes. we, what were you told about why that was? Um, because I'd already had a, an, a, a previous appointment, I've already had, I'd seen somebody 
And I said, but I haven't seen the specialist. And they were saying, no, but, but you know, you, you've actually seen somebody. So um, now we just have a follow-up on it. And, and so what did you do about that? Well, I said to them, um, <laughs> um, I, I asked whether I could see the consultants, and she said, well, if you really want to see her, she, it'll be months ahead, you'll have to, have to wait. So I was quite upset, and I went to the GP, and, and um, she, she was crosser than I was, really, I think. <laughs> And you were then moved to the consultant's list? Yes, she wrote and she asked for the appointment to be brought forward, which wasn't possible. But um, finally in April, um, I didn't know I was going to see the consultant. When I got there, I was quite surprised that she said, I've switched you to my list. And you said in your statement you found that appointment with the consultant very helpful. Yes, it was. Can you tell us what the consultant discussed with you that was particularly helpful? Well, she said I could have treatment to start with. <laughs> um, I, I think she sort of, she, she took me through, um, I, don't, I don't know, she was, she, she was reassuring, put it that way. You've described in your statement that she was reassuring and informative. Yes. Um, and she uh, ex explained uh, what, what was happening. Yeah. She also picked up on the peripheral neuropathy, yes. which she hoped might improve once you'd been cleared of the virus. Yes. Was that the first time someone had put the connection together? Yes, absolutely. Oh, the, the, the registrar before, that I saw before, she also made the connection, the, the one that, um, well, it wasn't her department. <laughs> The consultant, as you say, also said you could start treatment, and you did start treatment two yes. months later, and yes. you uh, took Mavaret for eight weeks. Yes. Um, and uh, the results from that have been have been positive, I think, in terms yes, of... Yes, they have, and the liver damage that I had, which was um, mild to moderate, um, has, has now, well, <laughs> from a year ago, put um, its it's dropped a point. You've told your f immediate family about the infection, but not, other pe not many others. Can you help us with why that is? I've moved on since then, I have to say. Um, I don't know, I, I just didn't... It was partly because I was a, a local teacher and I was worried about upsetting parents, you know, that they might think, oh my goodness, you know, if, if a child scraped a knee or something like that, this, this lady has been um, dealing with it. Um, I don't know, I, I, I just didn't particularly feel that I, I wanted to sort of explore that side of it at that particular time. I have, I have told a few friends since and I've been quite concerned that there was one who said to me that she'd, she's not a friend, but an acquaintance, that she'd had a, a blood transfusion at the same time, and I said, you should get checked. And she said, oh, no, I'm fine. And that concerns me. <laughs> you retired early from your work as a teacher. I did, yes. Can you uh, help us with, with how that came about and how much with hindsight, you think that may have been linked to uh, the uh, hepatitis C? I think, it, I think it was possibly linked because of the, the sheer exhaustion of the work. And I did notice that other members of staff, although obviously they were tired and stressed as well, seemed to, to deal with it better. And that I had more absence to sort of just recharge really, to, to recover from sort of minor illnesses. Um, and when there were extra things after school, I used to, to really think, oh, no, I've done enough. You know, I've done my day's work. What have I got to do this? Uh, I never used to feel that way. Um, and I, I, I just used to sort of think it was my age. But I'm not so sure any longer. And since having the treatment, what's your physical health been like? It, it has been better. Yes, it has been better. I still suffer from neuropathy and struggle a bit with that. But um, I, I, I just 
there's, there's more of a feeling of well-being. That, you know, I used to wake in the night sometimes feeling very hot and nauseous, and that's never happened then. And I had a limited appetite before I could eat so much, and then I couldn't eat any more. And it used to worry me when I went out for meals and things like that, that I had to leave food, which doesn't happen now. You applied for financial assistance from the EIBSS. Yes, I did. And you said in your statement the process was quite straightforward for yes, you. Yes, it was. And your application was accepted. Yes, it was, because I was fortunate in that um, the Bristol Health Authority had just kept all my records, and I don't know why. They, they didn't give me any... Um, they didn't give me any hope that they would have them. And then he phoned me up and said, um, he said, I'm just very pleased to tell you that I have found your records and they are there. I think you said that he was a, seemed to be as surprised as, as yes, you he was. were that he'd found them. Uh, yes, he was. Yes, he really didn't think that they would have kept them. Thank you. So I'm conscious of the time and the need for the stenographers to take a break. I wonder if now is a good time to take our morning break. Uh, yes, well, it, it would be. Let's, let's take a break then until quarter past 12. Um, uh, and uh, if, if uh, Mr. BG can, can hear this, um, he will understand that we will get to him uh, immediately after the, the break. Immediately after the break, we'll hear the evidence of Mr. BG. Yes. So quarter past 12.